Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. There is an enormous amount to get through this week. Opening weekend in Belgium, always a banger. A surprise at the UAE Tour. An old Gran Camino that you could have mistaken for last year's race. The Fon Ardèche and Drome Classics. Omloop van Het Hageland and the Tour of Rwanda. Better get going. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learned that if you can't keep up with the winner of a race as you're shepherding them towards a podium, you might as well use an e-scooter. This was the race official on Saturday after Omloop, and here he is again on Sunday after Kuna. We also learned that if you go off-road in the UAE Tour, it's not particularly easy to get back onto it. And finally, we learned that Visma Lisa Bike have not been resting on their laurels over the off-season. This time last week, they'd won a grand total of three races between the men's and women's squads. They're now on 11, having taken nine wins in the space of four days, six of them on Saturday and Sunday alone. I mean, it wasn't a surprise that they won the men's Omloop Het Newsblad, which is where I'll start. Uh, their roster was stacked full of riders who could pretty much all legitimately win the race themselves. Four of those seven got themselves into a 35-man group that went clear very early in the race, and it wasn't long after live coverage started that they put the hammer down a second time to put themselves into an even better position. Wout van Aert, Matteo Jorgensen and Christoph Laporte were joined by Tom Pidcock, Tom Schoind, who was on fire, Arno de Lee and initially Gianni Moscon, but he was soon dropped. So three riders in a group of six for Visma and with a healthy advantage over an unorganised looking chasing bunch. It was inevitable that one of them would eventually go solo, but before that happened, Schoins dropped all of them on the Berendries. Now, some people have argued that Wout van Aert simply waited for his teammates there. I don't believe that argument. I just think he couldn't get onto the wheel of Schoins. Either way, Schoins sat up uh, because you're not going anywhere solo if you've got three Visma Lisa bike riders behind you. A few k's later, Jorgensen took a flyer, and without any instant reaction, he soon carved out a decent gap as he headed towards Heraldsbergen and the infamous Muir Kappelmuir. Now, if you'd have told me there and then, in fact, I think if you told anyone there and then, that Jan Tratnik would eventually outsprint Niels Pollock to take the win, you wouldn't have believed them. Either that, or you'd have assumed that the front six had been sent off course somewhere. Now, the speed with which this race turned on its head was quite unbelievable. So our first real sense of how close the bunch was was on the lower slopes of the Moor when the helicopter panned out there. All of a sudden, they were back in the game. Tim Wellens, who punctured out the original 35-man group, was one of the first across, along with Ivan Garcia Cortina. But over the top of the final climb of the day, the Bosberg, a large group suddenly came together. So all of a sudden, Visma Lab went from being in full control of the race to suddenly having to rethink their whole game plan. As we have since found out, of course, we shouldn't have doubted. Jan Tratnik and Niels Pollock went on the attack and without any initial response, they soon opened up a big lead. Despite a chase from Lotto Destiny, Uno X and some other teams, they were not caught before the line. It seemed clear to me that Pollock rode for second place in the finale there. He went to the front early and just basically stayed there. And once Tratnik kicked for the line, the German could only manage a couple of pedal strokes out of the saddle before admitting defeat. Fair enough, I guess, if you're on your last legs. At least guarantee that you get at least second on the day. But what a brilliant win for Jan Tratnik, in leg warmers no less. The first Slovenian ever to win the race and doing so just one day after his 34th birthday. He just seems like a really nice character to me, so I was glad to see him getting his own chance there. Uh, incidentally, there's a really insightful article on him over on globalcyclingnetwork.com where he talks about everything he's overcome to get to where he is now. I'll leave a link to that in the description just down below. The women's was an equally fascinating race that bore some similarities to the men's. In that, I mean that there was one team that looked unbeatable in SD Works. So they had their three key riders, Kopecky, Vibes and Vollering, all towards the front of the race as we got our first live pictures. But a key difference over the men's was that one of their rivals had already flown the coup. Elisa Longo Borghini went solo with about 30 k's to go, bridging up to and past the early breakaway of the day, and finally, finally forcing SD Works to use their own resources to do the chasing. Uh, the key split happened on the Moor, and the composition of the four-woman lead group was just perfect in my eyes. Kopecky had Voss glued to her wheel, but close behind was Borghini's teammate, Shirin Van Anroy. So Kopecky was isolated there, with two riders from Lidl Tretford Company, as well as the best rider in the history of the sport. 
Over the top of the Bosberg, they were still all together, and the final flat run into Nineveh was fascinating. You've got this really interesting dynamic there, where the two little Trek riders know that they're not as fast in a sprint, and then two others that are closely marking each other while still having to keep an eye on the others. It was a reminder of why Voss has won so much in her long career. It's not just down to pure power and physiology, she is just so tactically astute. I don't think there was one moment in those final few kilometres where she wasn't fully in control of her own destiny and in turn, those around her. Uh, Kopecky was getting frustrated at points whilst Van Anroy and Longo Borghini did what they could to try and go solo. The one thing I thought they didn't do too well was sitting up when they got caught. Uh, every time one of them went, the other one was distanced behind, but often they would continue pressing on on the front, even when Kopecky and Voss had got back on their wheel. Uh, anyway, it was a difficult situation for them to be in, but at the same time, great to see another team really taking it to SD Works. In the final, Van Androoy rode for Longo Borghini, but really it only served to give us the sprint and deux that we all expected. How good is Mariana Voss though? like she comfortably beat the world champion in the sprint to win at what was her first ever attempt in that race. And I know that's hard to believe, but that was her debut at Omloop Het Newsblad. I guess mainly because she's often coming off the back of a cyclocross season at this time of year. It marked her 249th career victory on the road, and it also showed that she is back. She had iliac artery surgery last year, and so I think we all question whether she'd get back to her very best. Well, now we have our answer. That ride was exemplary in every way. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about the men's envelope was that it was the fastest edition we'd ever seen. And 24 hours later, we witnessed the fastest ever edition of Kuna Brussels Kuna. Uh, the race opened up very early yet again. I don't even know why I'm surprised, to be honest, at this point. It's pretty much become the norm now. No prizes for guessing which team lit it up. Visma Lisa bike. A group of five was clear as live coverage started with just under 100 k's to go, but just a handful of kilometres later, Visma had ripped the race apart. By the time things settled down again over the hardest cobble climb of the day, they had one rider though in a lead group of four. However, when that one rider is Wout van Aert, you don't have too much to be disappointed or worried about. Joining him were Wellens, Lascano and Pithy, and although the New Zealander was dropped around 20 k's later, you've got to take your hat off to him. Just to be in that group is an achievement in itself, particularly given how early this is in his career. Anyway, back to the race, and there's not a whole lot to report after that. We barely saw anything of the peloton or chase groups on the coverage, and by the time we did, it was pretty clear that they weren't going to be riding for the win. And so we just watched three hitters riding through and off together for an hour and 20 minutes. We had to wait until the final 5Ks then to see a first move from the front three. Uh, Wellens making a sly move on the opposite side of the roundabout to try and catch Van Aert out. There was a bit of a sense of inevitability about the outcome in the end. Lascano tried inside the last K, but his legs were shot to pieces, so he didn't really stand a chance. Van Aert started his sprint off the back of that, and Wellens was unable to come around him. So not a huge surprise. Van Aert wins on debut and answers all the critics who said his form wasn't as good as it should be just 24 hours previously. And capped off what was an incredible weekend, of course, for the team. No single team has ever won Omloop and Kerna two years in succession, but now it's been done. Visma Lisa Bike have simply dominated all of the cobbled classics outside of the monuments for the past 12 months. The good news, though, for neutral viewers at least, is that Machu van der Poel and Mas Pedersen, amongst others, will be back for the cobbled races in March and April, so things shouldn't be quite so one-sided as they were for the last two days. Uh, Christophe Laporte looked blooming good as well, though, didn't he? Fifth on Saturday after leading out Van Aert and then winning the sprint for fourth yesterday with ease. Uh, with these races opening up earlier and earlier, though, I do wonder whether organisers are going to be forced into starting live coverage sooner. Neither Omloop nor Kerner are produced live from start to finish, and that meant that we missed a lot of action, particularly yesterday in Kerner, actually, where not a lot happened for the final 70Ks. We basically watched those three riders cruising for an hour and a half before fighting it out at the finish. Uh, just before I move on, you may have noticed that I am sporting a brand new t-shirt today ahead of a fairly prestigious gravel race that's coming up this Saturday in Tuscany. If you would like to purchase one, uh, simply head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com and you'll find this one and plenty of others over there. I shall move on now to the UAE Tour, the second World Tour level men's stage race of the year. The list of sprinters there was second to none. It was basically just Jasper Phillips are missing, and so it was remarkable that one man came close to winning all four of the bunch sprints. 
Tim Malia is a man on fire right now, and it wasn't just his kick to the line that was impressive, it was his awareness and instinct and reaction time too. He barely seemed to put a foot wrong at any point, and I don't think anyone would deny that he was the best sprinter there by some margin last week. The first of those victories came on stage one. Malia found himself out of position, and then a moment later he was almost too close to the front. Thankfully for him, Milano took a flyer with Gaviria on his wheel, allowing Malia to open up his sprint with a couple of riders breaking the wind in front of him. On the overhead shot, the difference in speed is quite incredible. Uh, three days later, he was at it again, only this time it was Olaf Coy opening up early and hoping to steal the march on the others. Malia, though, was straight on it yet again, and it was another comfortable win. His final stage win came on Saturday, and it was his most impressive in terms of pure numbers. He hit 1,660 watts and over 72 kilometers per hour in the final 200 meters there, so no wonder nobody's getting around him. Uh, on all three occasions that Malia won, it was Arvid Decline who finished second, mightily impressive in that sort of company. He looks like he's taken another step up this season. Uh, the one sprint that Malia didn't win was stage five. Uh, there he followed Sam Wellsford after Danny Van Poppel had opened things up to the left, but on the other side of the road, Olaf Coy was already a few bike lengths ahead of them and they couldn't quite pass him before the line. Again, given the sprinting field in the race, that win is going to be high up on the prestige order in Coy's list of wins. Uh, Malia did have an excuse that day though, a slow puncture at the finish, which he was very keen to point out to Coy after they'd crossed the line. The first shaping of the GC came on day two's individual time trial, and it couldn't have gone much better for UAE Team Emirates. Brandon McNulty started early, and he had a long time sat in the hot seat, and the only riders that even got close to his time were his own teammates, Jay Vine and Mikel Biel. And with Adam Yates not too much further back, it put that team in a commanding position on the GC, but that GC was further reshaped on stage three. A nasty crash for Adam Yates took him out of the race there, not immediately. Uh, he did remount and rejoin the peloton, but he was later pulled from the race by his team after it was clear he'd suffered from concussion. It meant that UAE weren't quite as comfortable in terms of the GC. Uh, Biel did a fantastic job there, controlling things for much of the 21k climb to Jabel Jais, but once his work was done, there was nothing that McNulty and Vi could do when Ben O'Connor made his move. And what an impressive team display that was. Valentin Paripand gave the signal to his teammates and then attacked so hard the Australians struggled to keep up with him. That he did, and that he then managed to hold a gap all the way to the finish line, was a testament to just how good his early season form is. Uh, all was not lost for UAE, with Jay Vine finishing second on the day and moving into the overall lead. McNulty averaged over 400 watts in the final half an hour of that stage, but when the accelerations came in the final K, he was unable to keep up with the pace. So not in quite the dominant position that they started the day in, but nobody could have predicted they'd end this race without anyone in the top 10 of the general classification. But that's exactly what happened. On the final climb of the race, Jabel Hafit, McNulty was distanced early after Decathlon AG Tuala did it up. And after that, we had a really strange sequence of events. So Vine rode up the group, seemingly with ease, to go and have a word with his teammate Biel. Shortly after that, Biel was on the front himself drilling it, presumably after being given instruction to do exactly that. And then just a few seconds later, we saw Vine talking on the radio while simultaneously drifting back through the front group and eventually getting dropped. It just seemed so bizarre and I wasn't sure what had happened there, that maybe there was some sort of illness or food poisoning with the team or something, but that wasn't the case according to everything I've heard and read since, so very strange. Anyway, it left O'Connor as the virtual leader on the road and it's incredible just how much that changes the dynamics for a rider. He went from being basically the hunter to the hunted and having to keep his eye on a whole heap of riders that were still close to him on GC. Uh, the other dependable Bill Bow gave it a couple of nudges, uh, but they were both caught out when Michael Storer made a move near the top of the steeper part of the climb, taking two riders with him. One of those riders was Lennart van Eetveld of Lotto Destiny, and as they were just about to be caught, he made his move. A combination of hesitancy and probably a lack of legs behind allowed him to open up a really decent sized lead and one that only seemed to grow from there to the finish. He averaged 470 watts for three minutes on that attack at the top of the climb and in the end that was enough not only to take the stage but also the general classification. With Van Eetveld taking 10 bonus seconds on the line and O'Connor taking four for third place, the Belgian took victory by just two seconds. Ultimately, the difference between winning and losing for Van Eetveld was actually a move that he made on stage five that many thought was completely foolish. That day he went up the road in a breakaway 
on a day that was 99% sure to finish in a bunch sprint. So the reason people thought it was foolish was basically the extra energy expenditure involved, of course. But he took six bonus seconds at the intermediate sprints that day and would not have won the race overall had he not. Our man George Paul was on the ground at UAE last week and speak to a lot of the riders. And apparently Van Eekvelt didn't go in that break to get the bonuses, but just for a bit of extra training ahead of yesterday's stage. Over to Spain now, where the rain seems to fall mainly on Galicia. Uh, you may remember that last year's first stage was eventually cancelled three quarters of the way through due to snow, while this year's opening time trial stage was neutralised from a GC Times point of view due to high winds and rain, which remained for pretty much the entirety of the four-day race. There was still a stage win up for grabs on the opening day, though, uh, which they did on road bikes, incidentally, and there was one man who was head and shoulders above the rest. Josh Tarling scorched around the course, close to two kilometres per hour quicker than anybody else. In 15 k's, he put 42 seconds into Darren Rafferty. Mightily impressive from both of them, to be honest, but Tarling looks like he might have gone up another level this year. I mean, that makes sense, given that he's still only 20 years old, but that is a scary prospect. The next three stages followed a similar pattern to last year, in that Vinugor, or Vinugor Hansen, as Cy pointed out last week, won all three. Uh, what was great to see in the first of those, though, was Egan Bernal, as the last man able to stick on his wheel. Second place on the stage was definitely a step in the right direction, and I think one we've all been hoping to see. Vinugor was solo again on stage three, 29 seconds ahead of a chasing group led in by 22-year-old Carlos Canal of Movistar. Whilst on a shortened stage four, he came to the line 16 seconds ahead of Lenny Martinez of Groupama. It goes without saying, he also took the GC. Uh, Martinez was second at almost two minutes and Bernal on the third step of the podium. In France, UAE team Emirates took wins in both the Fourne Ardèche and Fourne Drone Classics at the weekend. Juan Ayusa took his first win of the season there on Saturday, getting the better of Roman Gregoire in the sprint to the line, whilst yesterday he finished runner-up to Mark Hirschi. There was an awful crash though for Lars van den Berg, or a very scary one at least, because he fell unconscious whilst on his bike, as we wished the rider from Group Armour FDJ all the best in his recovery. In Belgium yesterday, Kristin Faulkner took a really impressive win at the Omloop Van Het Hageland. In a race that, by her own admission, didn't really suit her, she broke clear on her own with 50 k's to go, never to be seen again. And it was not even close. She had almost two minutes on second place Misha Bredevelt as they crossed the finish line. I will finish with the Tour de Rwanda, which turned out to be a very successful race for Israel Premier Tech. They came away with the overall win and four-stage win from eight, two apiece for Ettemore Einhorn and Joseph Blackmore, and it was the Brit who also took the overall. So a decent week for the 21-year-old, I think you could say, and you'd hope that'll be enough for him to be offered a contract with the World Tour team, because he currently rides for their development squad. Uh, Blackmore also competes a lot in mountain biking, in which he's the current under-23 mountain bike national champion, and sometimes in cyclocross as well. So another youngster who can seemingly do it all. I am jealous. Uh, the skills he's developed there go some way to explaining his victory celebration on the final stage. If you haven't already seen it, I can recommend it. Check out Israel Premier Tech's social channels. Right, that's all for this week. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you again next Monday.